Let us pray. Gracious and loving God, I ask now that the words of my mouth, the meditation of all our hearts, be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, for you are our strength and our Redeemer. Amen. Amen. Today is the day in which God shows no partiality. This is the day that the Lord has made, for God is in our very midst. Christ brings new life to everyone, and right now, this Easter 2020 is one that we will remember. The COVID-19 virus also shows no partiality, for it touches the lives of everyone. But the Easter message also reaches the whole world, and perhaps in a radically new way this year. This Easter is one for the ages. As we continue in physical isolation, we watch the world cope with this pandemic. Our churches are empty. Today is a time where we will help one another grow in the Easter message and in our response to the virus as we practice safe distancing. This is a change. Mr. Fred Rogers once wrote concerning change and children, In any time of family, community, or worldwide stress, the most important question in a young child's mind is, who will take care of me? Young children can't take care of themselves, so in order to survive, they must have others to take care of them, he said. The best we adults can do is let our children know that we'll take good care of them no matter what. That's what helps them grow in good times and in bad. My friends, I believe that we are experiencing today what is a period of new growth for the world, for ourselves, and for our beloved church. You see, the Easter message does not end with Jesus rising from the dead. It continues on. The true message, I think, is when Mary Magdalene went and announced to the disciples and said, I have seen the Lord. The Easter story is not a spectator sport. It's not something you experience on the sidelines. You have to get in the game. It's an active thing. The story of the resurrection asks us to bear witness to God's love, to share it and to live it. Peter says in Acts, he commanded us to preach to the people and to testify that he is the one ordained by God. But as we sometimes know, It's difficult to express this joy to the broader world. Even the visitors to the tomb came expecting death, but instead they found new life. This is what the church is experiencing now. But I'll get back to that in a minute. You see, those at the tomb were both joyful at Jesus' absence from the tomb, but they were also terrified. How afraid the world is today. And now the world is in a perpetual vigil, a watching over with sincere prayers from all faiths for healing. We tremble in fear. But perhaps we can recall Jesus' words to Mary when she reaches out to touch him. Jesus describes the resurrection and perhaps faith when he says, I'm right here. I'm right here but you can't hold me. Over the years, you may have heard bishops, clergy, lay ministers, and others claim that the church is not the building, the church is the people. Some of us cringe at these words because we love our church buildings so. As we are isolated at home, we become fixed on what we have. And this is no different, I think, than a relationship that we have with our church buildings. This claim, the church is the people, not the building, has become more exact this Easter season, more than in any other way that I can remember. We're unable to be in our church spaces. The sacredness of worship at home is not as palpable as being in a historic church. Dust settles on the pews and no Holy Communion is shared, and for many this is upsetting. Within England, this is the first time of massive church closures since 1213. Of course, the reason then was political and not because of a plague. Yet I find myself asking the question, is the church empty? 
And the more I reflect, the more I pray, I truly believe that the church is more engaged, it is fuller than it has been in quite some time. I have seen the church in action. I have seen the fullness of the church during this season of Lent. People are stepping up to support the online ministry phone chains established to continue our connections. Parish staff going above and beyond and volunteers. Food bank continues. This delights my heart. This is the Easter story. We rise out of the tomb to spread the gospel in a new way, in a new radical way. So today I'm going to encourage us to laugh. Of course, we all have a different sense of humor, but I think it helps us quote, uh, cope, rather. Of course, COVID-19 is no laughing matter, but trying to connect through this gift, I believe, can be life-giving. I've always believed that humor is the most significant activity of the brain. Laugh, you say? What do you mean? The study of laughter is relatively new. Some believe that it increases our catecholamine levels, which affect our mental functions, including our interpersonal responsiveness, our alertness, and our memory. It is also suggested that it stimulates the endorphins, the release of endorphins, which can result in decreased pain and a sense of euphoria. Finally, laughter has been shown to reduce the secretion of our stress hormones. My favorite play, or one of my favorite play, is Lazarus Laughs. It's a play by Eugene O'Neill written in 1925. It tells the story of the man from Bethany. Within the play, Lazarus explains to his friends that there is no such thing as death, only God's eternal laughter. In the drama, the following scene plays out. Lazarus's friends ask, What is beyond there, Lazarus? What is beyond there? What is beyond? He responds, There is only life. I heard the heart of Jesus laughing in my heart. There is eternal life in no, it said, and there is the same eternal life in yes. Death is the fear between. And my heart reborn to love of life cried, yes, and I laughed in the laughter of God. After reflecting on his words, Lazarus' friends begin to sing, Lazarus laughs, our hearts grow happy, laughter like music, the wind laughs, the sea laughs, spring laughs from the earth, summer laughs in the air, Lazarus laughs, laugh, laugh, laugh with Lazarus. Fear is no more, there is no death. Laugh, laugh, fear is no more, there is no death. Dear friends, Jesus is alive. The church is more active than ever. The church is alive in you and me. The church is alive in the kind call of a friend, in the caregiver's long shift, in the researcher's effort to find a vaccination, in the nurse who struggles to keep their mask on because it's uncomfortable, in the doctor and in the long haul truck driver, in the employee who stocks the shelves of our stores. The church has never been more alive than right now, than today. And if we thought it wasn't, well, maybe we need to laugh at ourselves. Amen. Amen.